it's Thursday podcast at the Grapevine podcast, and we take questions from uh, the people on Twitter and on Facebook and on uh, YouTube. And Brian Smith, that Brian Smith triple zero four three one five asked, "You said one time Stan Jonathan had a ten stitch cut and didn't bleed. Was that real or a figure of speech?" He goes, "I was ten years old when I heard you say that, and it stuck with me." Tuscarora Indian boy, he was a tough guy. He was the toughest fighter I think I've ever seen. I remember he did that, and I remember the guy hit him with a stick and cut, and I looked at it, and it never even bleed. I said, this guy is a tough guy. And let me tell you a story, too. His kids are tough, too. I remember in the buses one time, we were, I, we were going to the airport, and Stan come up and asked me, he said, can my wife and kids drive the airport, too? They were going back to Canada. I said, sure. So they were sitting at the back, and they couldn't have been over five years old. The one kid couldn't have been over five years old. So they were marching up, and I remember this. He was cocky like Stan walking up. So I, you know, I just happened to say, um, well, look at all the little munchkins. He, and the kid turned me, stopped, and he said, ah, shut up, just like that. Well, you didn't say that to Coach Boy. The guys loved that one. And the guy, and I used to kid on, you know, Tim, the guys did not want. I have to, hey, Stan, he's listening right now. The guys did not want Stan. They wanted uh, another player instead of Stan. And I remember the very first time I saw Stan, I were in the Toronto. We we're going to play Toronto Maple Leafs, and we always come in Friday. And uh, Harry come along with us, and he said, "You want to go and see our number one draft choice? We're going to have it. Must have been my first year." So we went down to Peterborough. We took, we drove down to Peterborough, went into Peterborough, and we saw Dougie Hallward. I think Dougie Hallward was our number one draft choice. I think he broke his leg that game. And why were these? Do you want to stay for the rest of the game? I said, yeah, why not? And uh, boy, I I think his number was eighteen. And boy, oh boy, and was he was he banging and was he hitting and fighting? So when they had a draft, I was there, and I said, "Can we get Stan Jonathan? Can we get Stan Jonathan?" So I think I, I think he went about fourth or fifth. We had nobody else to pick, so they picked Stan Jonathan. Boy, that was the best draft I think we ever had when we got him. And when he came, though, like I said, the players didn't want him. He was too cocky and everything. But boy, was he a beauty! I remember. When I, I used to shoot the puck in all the time on the on the goaltender, and they pick it up and put you know the, that play you know dump it in and all that, and Stan for some reason skated in front, and just as I was about to slap it in, and I hit him on the ankle. I don't know whether I broke it or not, but I hit it. I think I think we cracked it pretty good, and to make a joke after it, he's laying there, and I said, and they say I don't have a hard shot. I remember he scored a very memorable goal for us. You listen, Len, let me tell you a story about that goal. That was the goal that, that I remember, of, I always remember, was on Rogi Vashon. It was in L.A., and I, we, I did, it learned me a big lesson, too, that whole playoff series with L.A. We were, we were up 3-1 or something like that, and, uh, you know, like we were going to win again, L.A. again, and everything like that. And I, would, I wasn't up. And the players weren't up, and believe it or not, they beat us in the Boston Gardens. Now we're at three two, and you know I remember that goal, shot from the point, and um, Butch Goring tipped it in. And it's the only time in my life I've ever seen a guy carried off the ice, and it was a big goal. It must have been. So now we go back to L.A. And we're losing again, and I remember driving. I remember I had a little car, little red car. And I'm driving home after a morning skate, and you know, while this here, and I'm thinking, I did not have the players up. It's my fault. And I remember there was a record out there called, uh, it was a record called, they, You've Blown It All Sky High by Jigsaw. And that's, that come on, that come on the radio. And I really did thought I'd blow it high, sky high. Now we go back to LA. If they win this game, it's 3 3, and anything can happen. And I know I'm fired at the end. I'm getting fired a lot. Anyhow, it's, I think there was only 14 seconds left and we're losing. And, 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 and you know, everybody talks about the loudest building that, uh, of all time. And the loudest building of all time I've ever heard is the L.A. Forum because they used to have steel around the bottom and the people used to stamp their feet. And they, it was unbelievable stamping their feet. They thought they'd won. And, and Stan shot it from the side. And I remember it hit Vogi Vashon on the shoulder and bounced in. And somebody says, it's in, it's in. I'm telling you, I almost fainted. And that was the same, that was the same thing 
Dave Hutchison, I, I wonder if he's listening. So it's tied. We're going into overtime in the playoffs. And and uh, and and Dave Hutchison, for some reason, I don't understand him. To this day, I'd like to talk to him. Instead of just icing the puck, it was in his end. And instead of just icing the puck, he went to slap it, broke his stick, and went to Greg Shepard. Now, Greg Shepard is the left-hander going in on the net. Now, Dave doesn't know what to do. He takes the stick and he fires it at Shepard. Still going, and, and Bobby Schmatz is a right-hand shot. Now, you have to think of this. He's going on the left side. Bobby Schmatz is over in the left and on the left side with a right-hand shot. I thought he was going to pass it, too. And what he does, he shoots it with just an inch like that, went in, and we went in for overtime. It's the first time I almost fainted. I remember the story you were telling us about, and a lot of people out there know Robin Thicke these days, the famous singer, um, and they know Al, the late Alan Thicke, but his mom was a real singer, Gloria Loring. Tell yeah. me about her singing the anthem for the LA. She was unbelievable, and I, I'd been at a few banquets that they were at when they first went in, uh, Alan Thicke and her, and, she, and she'd be up, he'd be up on the mic, and she'd say things back to him, and, and they let on, they weren't, they weren't getting along, they did, they Man, they, they always did get along, but they were giving shots back and forth. Boy, following them was like following Dennis Hall at a banquet. Anyhow, yeah, I remember she used to, she used to be at, at Center Ice, and she'd be worth a goal. And she would not sing till the national anthem till it was deathly quiet. And boy, everybody loved Everybody just loved it. Just when I know the players just she, – she inspired like Kate Smith. So – I used I was talking to Frosty, the trainer, our, our assistant uh, trainer, and I said to him, "You know that Gloria Loring? I, boy, oh boy, she sings before the national anthem. It's like you're down one nothing before you started." And in those days, if, if they didn't have a wireless mic, you had to have a wire come out to center ice, and she used to stand there with that mic. I still consider right to this day. And he says, "You don't want her to sing?" I says, "Well, I don't want her to sing at center ice. I want," and he says. Don't worry about it, Grapes. I thought, what are you going to do? And what he did, believe it or not, he crawled underneath all the seats. And just as she was going to sing, he had to wait. He cut the wire. <laughs> and she's trying to sing. And she had to go over it. I remember she had to go over the penalty box and sing in the penalty box. And that one, it wasn't the same. And that's the game we won. And I remember Frosty. I said, Frosty, how did you? And he said, don't ask. Cindy, he was, uh, Frosty, he was a good friend of yours. Well, you know, I hear, you know, a lot of the stories you say are about Frosty, and he's, he was like the Ray Donovan type guy. He just got things done. And uh, I remember one time, it was the end of the season. Who's Ray Donovan? Oh, he was, he's, he's a guy on TV. He's a, he's a fixer. He's oh, a fixer. Right. That's what they call a fixer. And uh, it was the last game of the season, and I couldn't bring my Monte Carlo up into the building. I had to park it down below. I come into the wives' room, and I am so happy because I had a beautiful... Beautiful 1974 Monte Carlo with spoke wheels. And I actually said to the ladies, I went the whole season and my hubcaps weren't stolen. I come out after the game, all four gone. I am heartbroken. And that's what I get for opening my big mouth. And you can see I'm pretty upset. And what did you do? You went to Frosty. And no, no. I was sitting in, I was sitting in my office and... Uh, he says uh, he said something about Cindy being upset, and I said, "Well, she should be upset. She drove the Monte Carlo here, and and uh, they the four hubcaps were stolen. Stolen, and you, you really did have you. Have, you I made mean, the nice spoke ones too. Oh, they were nice. Like the kids today, do they really know spoke? And they were worth a lot of money. And that's why I thought, oh, I'm, I'm pretty upset. So the next day, I came into practice, and there's a there's a hubcaps. I said. Hey, what in the world? How, how, like I'm looking, is that? He said, I said, how did you get those back, Frosty? He says, don't ask. <laughs> I'll tell you another story. And I have it hanging up, and I, I just love the picture. It's a real painting. It was done in 1903. And I used to drink in the place called the Iron Horse. Tim, you remember the Iron You were never in the Iron Horse. No, I didn't go. No. Home. Anyhow, I used to, it was the Iron Horse. It was right next to the Boston Gardens. I think it was in the Boston Gardens somewhere. And uh, it was an old bar, and they had a beautiful picture. It must have been hanging up there for 100 years. And it was hanging up, and uh, it was some cherries. Uh, it was an actual oil painting, some cherries coming out like that. And I, and I said to this bartender, a young bartender back then, I said, 
boy, I like that picture. I said, that is a, that's, a, that's a real oil painting. I really love that picture. He says, you really like it, Grapes? I says, yeah. Next day, I walk in. Here comes Frosty with the picture. Frosty, how the heck did you get that? You know, and I looked at it. So I go down to the bar, and um, I said, uh, gee, uh, how, like, I don't, how did that picture, how did I ever get that picture? He says, don't ask. His real name, Frosty, he was named, we used to call him Frosty all the time. He used to make up signs. I mean, a beautiful sign he made up. A great big sign that said, win it for blue. And I was, you know, was in the cartoon and everything like that. He was an ex-Marine. And when Bobby first went to uh, Boston, Bobby Orr, when he first went to Boston, he was his roommate. And I'll tell you one last story about him, about Frosty. I don't know if you appreciate it or not. But one time we yell at one in L.A., and we're flying back, the Boston Bruins were flying back, and Harry said, why don't we stop in, in Las Vegas and let the guys have a night out? And I said, mm-hmm. I don't know if that's a good idea or not. So I said, okay. So we stopped in Las Vegas, and I remember we had our picture taken and the whole deal at, the, at one of the shows and all that. So the next day, Frosty had a few that night, I must say, and we had all our bags. For some reason, I still can't get it. We, we had all our hockey bags uh, piled in front of the hotel and waiting for the bus. You know, Frosty was always up early. Now, if you ever laid on hockey bags, they're so nice and soft and they're really like a lovely bed. And he fell asleep. And he, he woke up and he saw this guy grabbing bags and he grabbed the guy and threw the guy down. It was a bus driver putting the, it was a bus driver putting the bags on the bus. Yeah, his real name was John Forstall, and, and like I said, he was Bobby Orr's uh, roommate, and I remember on the road all the time, him and Bobby used to play cr- cribbage all the time, and uh, they'd be on the plane, and that's all they do the whole time. You never hear of them, just the two of them playing cribbage. 